So in today's video, I will be sharing a recent discovery. As some might know, I've been into vintage computing as a hobby for about 12 years. A hobby I've been into because I grew up with a Pentium 3 machine many years ago. For many years now, I've never owned a 486 computer. The oldest machine I've experienced was the Pentium 75 MHz machine, which I still have to this day. The search for a 486 machine lasted around 9 to 10 years, if not longer than that. And now the search is apparently over, because I now have possession of a 486 class machine, surpassing the Pentium 75 MHz machine as the oldest computer I currently own. As for how I got this machine, it's kind of an interesting story. It started when I encountered this user in one of my old live streams. Oh. The fuck? What's up with saying pot? First he say spo, and then he said pot. But then fo? That doesn't make any sense, dude. Retro Dragon says ball. What's up with these three letter words? Retro Dragon. That's what that's all he's been saying during throughout the stream. He's trying to find your sleeper words. <laughs> sleeper to, words. Yeah, you you didn't know you were a sleeper agent? Well, Oh, there he goes again. Retro Dragon says, w WC. Bro, there is an infant in the chat right now. Random morphin. It's morphin time. Damn, Retro's be like, Nell. That's all he said is Nell. And then he also said Lar as well. What the fuck? Bro, I think. I'm wondering if that might be a bot. Probably. Yeah. While I was designing a map for Unreal Tournament, apparently this guy came out of nowhere to say random three-lettered words that make no sense. That's all he did and we guessed that it was just a bot. Except then, he started posting videos of retro PCs taking place in the back rooms. Hundreds of videos. All which were filmed with a real camera. Retro Dragon is kind of a mysterious individual, or should I say duo. They claim to be two lizards who live in the back rooms and run an undisclosed business there, and enjoy showing off their powerful technology on the side. But if I were you, I probably wouldn't tell them 1998 was 26 years ago. Anyway, Retro Dragon reached out to me recently saying he was decommissioning what he called Office Computer, unquote, and asked if I wanted it. I later asked Retro Dragon some more questions like how he keeps making so many videos and why he hangs around in the back rooms, and I didn't get any response from him. Nonetheless, I went ahead and accepted his offer, and while it was being shipped out to my location, I began to remember two years ago, when I randomly visited the back rooms. However, I believe the visit didn't last too long because there was a random active computer sitting there that said, CAUTION, DO NOT PROCEED TO A ENTRY. Of course, there was not really a reason specified, so I went back home. I would try to come up with an explanation for why that computer was off limits, but that would just cause the video to drag on. Anyway, the office computer shipped and arrived the next day, which is quite unusual for shipping, but at the same time, you have Amazon Prime same day delivery, and I don't think they sell vintage computers, at least not to my knowledge. Opening it up, we are greeted with bubble wrap and tape, though the office computer case did come out a bit beat up which isn't always a good sign, so I went ahead and opened up the case, and much to my surprise, it is actually a 486 machine. Aside from the beat up case, there seems to be a bit of red paint on the top. I am not sure if someone used the spray paint and accidentally got it on the top or not, but who knows? At least it gives this machine a bit of character. Looking at the front, we see the usual power, turbo, and reset switches, along with an LED numeric panel, showing the processor clock frequency. The computer has an Acer CD drive with 40 times the speed, which is pretty interesting to see considering I remember hearing about their all-in-one 
Acer Aspire lineup from the mid-90s back when I was browsing old advertisements on YouTube, and even found some ads from Computer Gaming World magazine. So not only did I get an office computer, but I also got a CD drive with volume buttons, as most of my barely tested disk drives had a volume adjustment knob or at times had none at all. Along with the standard floppy drive, there is an unlabeled disk inside. It turns out after some brief testing that it's a boot disk, which will come in handy when I need to reinstall Windows because CD-ROM booting isn't really a common feature in most machines. Instead of the typical AT power supply, some modifications were made, and a modern ATX power supply from EVGA was used to maintain its longevity. It's also a good thing that the AT keyboard connector was replaced with a PS2 keyboard connector, as I don't have any possession of an AT keyboard let alone an adapter, but those adapters exist on the market somewhere. After opening up the panel, I've noticed right away that the heatsink and fan came off. It turns out it was a clip-on heatsink, and it was an easy fix. In this machine, we have an Intel 486DX4 processor clocked at 100 MHz with PCI slots, making this a late-era 486 machine. For storage, we have a 3GB Western Digital Caviar 23200 IDE hard drive. The video card supplied is an S3 Verge DX with 4MB of video memory meaning that I can make a video about this card one day. This ISA Ethernet card is from SMC, and the sound card supplied is a Sound Blaster Vibra 16XV. The motherboard in question is the Soyo Foresaw 2, which uses an SIS chipset. The form factor is a Baby AT, which explains the size of the tower being a tad bit smaller than my Optiplex 9020 mid-tower PC currently being used as a Samba file server. For the system memory, 64 megabytes worth of SIM RAM were installed, which is actually plenty for a high-end 486 machine. It's also nice enough since certain motherboards were known to have the dreaded barrel and clock batteries. This motherboard uses the coin batteries instead, which is a nice have for a late Socket 3 motherboard. The machine came pre-installed with Windows 95, but however, two partitions were put together. One containing the operating system and the other containing essential stuff, like the installers for MS-DOS 6.22, Windows 95, and Windows for Workgroups 3.11, if I so desired to switch operating systems. Also, a nice touch is that the shareware version of Doom came pre-installed, along with some drivers that I ended up copying to my network share. I was originally going to cook up the video, but before I got around to it, I fired up Duke Nukem 3D, and the attract mode seemed rather off, especially in a certain area where it would choke for a brief time. At first, I thought it was a Windows 95 issue, as sometimes games are best played in MS-DOS mode for better performance. This wasn't the case, and I ended up troubleshooting for a while ranging from various factors like the video card and the 64 megabytes of RAM. I ended up reducing it back to 32 megabytes to no avail. After several hours of troubleshooting, I came to the conclusion that it had something to do with the motherboard. Despite the cache looking like it's installed, it wouldn't recognize it at all. On top of this, Running Top Bench indicates that the system has the performance of a 486DX2 clocked at 66 MHz. So I reached out to Retro Dragon once again, and I was shipped a replacement board, which to my surprise took about a day before it arrived. Good lord, shipping from the back rooms is really quick. However, at the time of recording this unboxing, the power went out, and I had to film this with a flashlight on in another room. This new motherboard had a DIN 5 connector meant for AT keyboards, but there's an adapter that was placed on the back of a note from Lithium Reverse Engineering dated in March 7th, 1998, 
Dear Miss Akage Magane, this signed, well, I barely know cursive writing, so I'll just skip that for now. To be fair, our school system cares way too much about football to be teaching people how to do cursive writing. Anyway, this adapter allows me to plug in my PS2 Dell Quiet keyboard to this machine. And on top of that, I got a really generous donation from Lithium Reverse Engineering. It turns out that not only did I get my first 486 machine, I also got myself a 3DFX Voodoo 2 card which is actually an OEM card called the Diamond Monster 3D2. Very huge thanks! This will definitely help with future tech videos going forward. Not to mention that I can finally enjoy Unreal the way it was originally intended. Anyway, after the power had gone back on, I went ahead and went on with swapping the motherboard, and this process took several hours of rearranging, irritation with figuring out motherboard jumpers for the front panel, and a few cuts to my hands because the case was pretty sharp. That's cheap PC cases for you. Funny enough, I've heard it was mostly popular in Europe. To me, these cases do look pretty nice if you look past the cases being pretty sharp. The motherboard in question is from Asus, which uses the same chipset as the previous motherboard, which would make the process a bit easier considering going from chipset to chipset can increase the chances of having to reinstall Windows. It is safe to say the machine works, and I was able to get the benchmarks going for this video. Starting off with the original shareware version of Doom, the game that came pre-installed with this 486 machine. Without the external case, you would get around 2711 real ticks, which is basically 27.55 frames per second. Not too terrible considering the game's frame limit is at 35 frames per second. But again, I think the 486DX4 should bring frame rates around the limit. Running the benchmark with the new motherboard and working external case results in 2,166 real ticks, which is basically 34.48 frames per second, which is very close to 35 frames per second. But it also means that the external case boosted the game by nearly 7 frames per second. Next off is Doom Nukem 3D from 3D Realms, the same game that led me to troubleshoot for hours. However, I should mention that before I got the new motherboard, I was able to achieve a small boost by changing the DRAM speed from faster to fastest. But from what I've heard, this can potentially bring in more weird issues depending on what you're running and what not. Regardless of that, the external cache appears to handle the same area that made the game look like it locked up for a brief period of time on faster DRAM, much better. Safe to say, the external cache does provide a smoother experience. The next game is Descent 2 from Parallax Software. While I tested the software version, I've also tested the S3D version just for fun. But I will show that off later. Anyway, the demo appears to boost the frame rates by about 5%. But then again, it's a tad bit more demanding than the original game. Not to mention trying to run this game at higher resolutions. At that point, you would rather use 3D acceleration or just get a Pentium. Now I did say that I have an S3 Verge, right? So I went ahead and did some comparisons between the software rendering DOS version and the S3D version meant for the S3 Verge. Now, for those who do not know, this video card, while great for 2D games, it is also notable for being what many would call a 3D decelerator. To be fair, Descent 2 on S3D runs at a fixed 640x480 resolution, so it's obvious that the low resolution of 320x200 would beat the S3 Virgin performance. Whereas, comparing 640x480 in software rendering against the S3 Verge, the performance seems to be somewhat on par with each other. 
Many would expect a good boost in performance compared to the software renderer, but then again, you could possibly make the software rendering beat the S3 Verge by turning on texture filtering, which from what I recalled, could tax the video card's performance. Now, speaking of taxing in performance, the last MS-DOS game to look at is Quake, which is a game that is best played on a Pentium. But like I said earlier, you could potentially benefit from using a 3D accelerator if possible. Without the external cache, we could see close to 8 frames per second. Not really playable without a good amount of tweaking, but it's not enough to bring out a smoother experience. However, with external cache, we got 9.5 frames per second, which is just about an extra 2 frames per second advantage but that's just about as much you could get for a late 486 machine. I also did an extra benchmark, like the Superscape 3D Bench. With cache installed, it gives us about a 10 frames per second advantage. On the Windows side, since I am running Windows 95, I figured I would test out the Voodoo 2 to see what frame rates I could get out of it, compared to software rendering. I believe I have a similar video planned for this in the future, but for now I will be testing out two games. First off, we have Quake yet again. This time we are comparing the MS-DOS release to GL Quake because 3DFX has many GL support. On the 3DFX side, the lowest we could go is 512x384. Whereas on the software side, the game is running at 320 by 200 resolution. While having no cache gave us 7.8 frames per second in the time demo, having an external cache boosted the time demo to about 9.5 frames per second. However, combined with the 3D effects Voodoo 2, the time demo gave us about 11.2 frames per second. I tried to adjust some settings through the console, but for some reason it still gave me the same result. I guess it has something to do with the way the 3DFX Glide API handles things. Either way, I imagined running Quake on software rendering at the same resolution GL Quake was running at. Would have been way worse in comparison. Lastly, the second game to check out is also meant for the Pentium. And that would be Raven Software's Techno Prisoners, released in 1997. While there isn't a benchmark feature to my knowledge, you could easily tell that the 3D effects card is giving it all it can. While the 3D accelerator card manages to surpass direct draw by a bit, it still isn't enough to provide a smoother experience. And for that, you would be better off investing in a Pentium machine. Also, do keep in mind that the lowest the game can go is either 640x480 or 640x400. But if you have a better Direct 3D card that could potentially be a bit on par with the original Voodoo, and also way better than the S3 Verge, you could likely give Direct 3D a try since that allows lower resolutions. But then again, even 3D effects has support for Direct 3D programs. But for some reason, it reverts to using the S3 Verge, resulting in an even crappier performance. As for Direct Draw, which is about as far as the S3 Verge could do, we have the shareware version of Necrodome, another obscure Raven Software title. Overall, the game performs okay, but not buttery smooth unless you're running this on a faster Pentium 2 machine. The results do seem a bit similar to those of the Pentium 75 machine because, funny enough, the Pentium 75 machine can be viewed as an alternative to a fast 486 machine. Considering the bus speeds between the two CPUs are a bit different, the DX4 has a 33 MHz speed bus, whereas the Pentium has a 50 MHz speed bus. While it's not the exact same because that would be kind of stupid, the Pentium 75 MHz is a bit more faster than the late 486. A bit faster, but also on the slow side during this era of PC gaming. Though you could get away with getting a bit more speed on the Socket 3 platform by upgrading to a Pentium Overdrive. 
although it originally launched at around $400. But by around 1996, you could have spent on a 150 MHz Pentium for around the same price. But this is just a rough estimate. Anyway, what are my thoughts on this 486 machine? Honestly, I actually enjoyed it. I finally got to experience what a late 486 machine would have been like, along with finally having a 3D accelerator card. And this video would not have happened sooner if it weren't for Retro Dragon's two generous donations. If you wish to check out retro computers that are being filmed in the back rooms, I recommend checking out the channel, which should be in the description down below. Well, that's about it for this video. Remember to give it a like if you enjoy this content, but remember that if you aren't enjoying this content because of these, I have a pro tip for you. First off, unplug your computer and laptop. After that, you can proceed to...